What is I factorial? Well, many people are surprised to find out that it's possible to extend the factorial function in a natural way beyond just the positive integers. Now, we know, for example, that 4 factorial just means 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 24. But what about 6.2 factorial, or even I factorial? What does that mean? Well, it turns out that there's a special function called the gamma function that allows us to extend the idea of factorials beyond just integers, beyond the natural numbers, and even to the complex numbers. Now, I've made a whole other video on the gamma function, and the link is in the description. But in this video, I'm going to avoid all of the terminology and notation related to the gamma function, and we're just going to look at the underlying idea and use that idea to figure out what I factorial is. Oh, and by the way, I'm not just making this up. If you go onto Wolfram Alpha and just type in I factorial, notice it gives you this answer, this kind of crazy decimal, 0.498 minus 0.155i. So this is a legitimate thing that we're talking about here. Now let's first of all think about what factorials are. So 3 factorial, for example, is 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6. 4 factorial, as I mentioned before, is 24. If we wanted to figure out 5 factorial, we could do 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, or we could just take 4 factorial and multiply it by 5, and we get 120. And to get to 6 factorial, we just take 5 factorial multiplied by 6, we get 720. Now, if we wanted to go the other way around, if we wanted to sort of reverse the process, we would divide. So to get from 6 factorial to 5 factorial, we divide by 6. To get from 5 factorial to 4 factorial, we divide by 5. Then we divide by 4, divide by 3, divide by 2. Now, what if we wanted to get back to 0 factorial, we would divide by 1. And 1 divided by 1 is 1. So if you've wondered why is 0 factorial defined to be 1, well, it's a very natural way to define 0 factorial as 1. Now, what about if we wanted to define negative 1 factorial? Well, then we would have to divide by 0. And 1 divided by 0 is undefined. So negative 1 factorial is actually going to be undefined. Now, we are going to extend the factorial function beyond just the integers. We'll extend it to decimals, and we'll even extend it to negative numbers but it won't extend to negative integers, negative whole numbers, so like negative one, negative two, and so forth. So how do we do this extension? Well, we're gonna look at certain functions, functions that have this form, x to the n times e to the negative x, for certain fixed values of n. So for example, if n is three, we'll have the function x cubed times e to the negative x. And if we go in here to Desmos, I've graphed the function x to the n times e to the minus x. And I've made a slider for n, and we set the slider to 3. So here's the function x cubed times e to the minus x. Now, it turns out that the area underneath this curve between 0 and infinity, so basically like the area of this hump here, is 6 square units. It's basically 3 factorial. Now, if I change this slider, if I move the n, so let's say we move the n to make it bigger, notice what happens to that hump. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we move to the right. So if I move it to, say, 4, well, it turns out the area here is 4 factorial. It's 24 square units. And this can be shown using calculus. And I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. But notice, though, that we can move the slider not just to positive whole numbers, but we can move it to decimals. So for example, when n is 4.8, when we have the function x to the 4.8 times e to the minus x, we could think of the area underneath this curve as being 4.8 factorial. In fact, that's how we're going to define 4.8 factorial. And really, for any value of n, any positive value of n, actually any value of n that's bigger than negative 1, this is how we'll define n factorial, the area underneath the function x to the n times e to the minus x between 0 and infinity. Now, I just said, for example, that the area underneath this curve here, when n is 4, is 24. It's 4 factorial. But I didn't actually show it. Why, why is it 24? So the claim here is that for n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., the integral from 0 to infinity of this function dx, so this just represents the area underneath this curve here, this function between 0 and infinity, is n factorial. So how do we know it's n factorial? Well, when n is 0, this is a pretty simple integral to calculate. x to the 0 is just 1, so this would just be the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x. And it's pretty straightforward to show that that would be 1. 
Now, to do the integral when n is 1 or 2 or 3, you'd have to use integration by parts to evaluate the integral. And for example, if n is 3, you'd end up having to do integration by parts three times. Now, kind of the slick way to do this, though, is to do a type of induction argument. And I give more of the details on how to do that in my video on the gamma function. So let's just assume that we've shown that this is true. Now, if that's the case, we're just going to define n factorial as being the value of this integral. And the great thing about this definition is it now allows us to say, for example, what is 3.7 factorial? And it's just going to be the value of this integral. Now, you need to use a, a calculator or computer to figure out what it is. And this is approximately 15.43. But this is how we define 3.7 factorial. Now, one thing I should point out about this is that if n is negative, then because of this x to the n term, at 0, we're going to get a vertical asymptote of this function. Now, if n is still bigger than negative 1, the vertical asymptote is still integrable, so we get a finite area under the asymptote. But if n is less than or equal to negative 1, this integral diverges. We get an infinite area. So we can't use this formula to define n factorial if n is less than or equal to negative 1. But it turns out that we still can define n factorial for values of n that are less than negative 1. And the way we do it is we use this equation. Now, it's not hard to show that this equation is true for all positive integers n, but we're going to assume that it holds more broadly for other values of n as well. And what the equation basically says is that if we know n factorial, then we can use this to figure out what n minus 1 factorial is. So this allows us to extend the definition of factorial to really all real numbers other than the negative integers. And the reason the negative integers are a problem is because notice this formula has an issue if n is 0. So that makes us not be able to define negative 1 factorial. And once we can't define negative 1 factorial, it means we can't define negative 2 factorial, and so on. But we've really extended the definition of factorial to all real numbers other than the negative integers. And with our definition of factorial that we now have, we get some very strange things. So for example, 1 half factorial is the square root of pi over 2. So that seems really strange. Why is pi getting involved with factorial? Well, I explain it in my other video on the gamma function. But remember, our goal is to find i factorial. So we're going to define z factorial for a complex number z to be essentially the same thing we had before, only we're having an, a z up here instead of an n. And this integral converges if the real part of z is greater than negative 1. And so the integral will converge when z is i. So i factorial is just the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the i times e to the minus x dx. Now what is x to the i? What does that mean? Well, we can write it as e to the natural log of x to the i. Now this natural log is really a complex logarithm, but it has the property that we can bring this constant out front just like the ordinary logarithm. So we can rewrite this as the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the i times natural log of x times e to the negative x dx. Now, if you're familiar with Euler's formula, Euler's formula says e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. In fact, here it is right here. This is one of the most famous and most beautiful formulas really in all of mathematics. e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. So since this is in that form, e to the i theta, where theta is natural log of x, we can rewrite this as cosine of natural log of x plus i sine of natural log of x. And then we can distribute the e to the negative x and write it like this. And notice, notice we have a sum of two things. So we can break this apart. The integral of the sum of two functions is the sum of the integrals. And we can bring the i out in front of this integral. Now, the first integral is the integral from 0 to infinity of cosine of natural log of x times e to the negative x dx. And the second one is the same, only we have sine instead of cosine. Now, it turns out that when you evaluate these integrals, you get about 0 0.498 minus 0 0.155i. Now, these integrals need to be done with some type of approximation techniques or with a computer, because as far as I'm aware, there are no nice closed form values for these numbers. So it's not as if one of these numbers is just like the square root of e or something like that. But this is i factorial. Now, I should mention that sometimes when doing crazy things like this with i, we do get some nice closed forms. For example, I made a video on i to the power of i. And it turns out that this is about 0 0.207, and the decimal goes on and on. But this value does have a nice closed form. It's just e to the negative pi over 2.
Well, thank you for watching. Please put a like on the video if you've enjoyed it and stay tuned if you want to see more videos like this.